angel was just about to turn to. We wrestled all the time. Angel and I would just be on the floor, tussling, laughing. And um, during that time, she would hit me, not intentionally, but while you're wrestling. And my right breast would hurt. I went for my annual, and I uh, said to my doctor, you know, when Angel and I wrestle, if she hits me in my right breast, it hurts. And he says, oh, you probably have lumpy breasts or fibrocystic breasts. And I said, well, I want a mammogram. And he's like, oh, you're too young. Because at the time, I was 33. Um, he says, you're too young. And I said, but I still want one. So he scheduled a mammogram for me. That Thursday, I was at work at a baseball game because I was an athletic director. And I get a phone call. And it was my doctor. And he says, we got the results back from your mammogram. And you have some microcalcification. And he says, that could be the beginning stages of breast cancer. I'm at this baseball game by myself. And I stopped breathing. And I say, OK. I spent a lot of time being frustrated, a lot of time being um, mad. Um, and just wondering why, and you know, and, and I give a lot of credit to Keisha because she's such a, you know, it is what it is. You know, okay, now what do we need to do to, to make it happen to, to get things? I mean, that that kept us moving forward. You know, I immediately flashed back to to a child uh, being a child um, because I lost my mom to cancer. When you when you lose someone who's so close to you, and someone who meant the world to you, and uh, someone that you just envisioned being able to share certain milestones in your life. Um, it was tough. I spent a long time being angry at God when my mom passed, um, you know, and I, and I mean years, um, because uh, she was the, the center of our family. You know, she was the glue that held our family together. Um, and, and when she passed, our family fell apart, um, so much so that we're still trying to recover to this day. And we're talking 20 years, you know, almost 20 years later. I grew up in a small town, Morgan City, Louisiana, that's born and raised. Uh -huh country girl. My husband calls me a swamp girl. He guess where I'm from. The first Tarzan movie was made in, in my hometown. So it's a it's a small town. It's a little country town. And, um, you know, I grew up playing outside until the street lights came on. It's six of us. It's three boys and three girls and my mom. My mom's first husband died in a motorcycle accident. And my dad died and uh, working offshore on a boat trying to save the lives of other people when uh, there was a gas leak and the gas overcame him. So, you know, it's always just been me and my mom and my brothers and sisters and we're very close. I didn't start playing basketball until I was 11 and in my town kids started at 5. People would come to my house in the summer for me to play AAU and I would say, no, I'm not playing that. I'm playing softball. That's why I like. I don't like basketball. And for four years I played high school basketball in my boyfriend at the time was being recruited by a bunch of schools and he was having a game and a coach from Tulane came and I walked up to that coach and I was just like what are you doing here and he's like I'm looking at you know this kid Joey Brown and I was just like oh are you a college coach and he was like yeah I was like well take my information down and give it to your women's coach so I gave him my stats I'm like oh I can't believe I did that and she called me and we talked and she came to one of my practices and then offered me a full ride scholarship. When I was uh, the intramural director here at CMU, um, Keisha was also the uh, intramural director down at Tulane. And so each year we have our, our national conference and uh, that year we were actually in Providence, Rhode Island. And there's a group of us that hang out. They went to a restaurant called Dave and Buster's. It's my first time there. And of course I migrated towards the basketball games. I'm playing by myself, everybody's off doing something and here comes Damon Brown in my ear talking. I can beat you. You're not that good. Oh, you got that score. And I am like, you need to get away from me, guy. I don't know you like that. And he just was relentless. But when people talk trash, it just annoys me till no end. And he kept talking and he kept following me everywhere I went. And it was, I was just like, guy, come on. Um, she didn't think anything about it. Um, but there's something in the back of my mind is like, well, I want to, you know, get to, you know, get to know this person a little bit more. So I'm sitting on this stationary motorcycle waiting for the group to finish. Out of nowhere, he comes and tackles me. 
This is a girl who's shy, doesn't say much, just kind of want to be left alone. In a public place, being tackled by a guy she doesn't know, and he's tickling me. I am furious. Um, but that summer, um, I actually went down to New Orleans for the Essence Fest. And so, out of the blue, I just kind of called her up and said, hey, I'm down here, you know, you mind if we hang out, you know, interested in hanging out for the day? And so, she didn't turn me down. And hey, Keisha, you know, maybe we have lunch or something. I'm like, sure, whatever. So we went for, went for lunch and she took me to the mall and she was actually getting ready to go to Jamaica um, for a trip. And so we did a little shopping and you know, just hung out for the day. And he tells me he can't remember where his hotel is. And then there's thousands of people in New Orleans for this festival. So I'm driving down Canal Street trying to figure out, is this your hotel, is this your hotel, is this your hotel? He's like, no, I don't remember, I don't remember. She kind of dropped me off on the corner of Canal where my hotel was at and kind of drove off. Didn't even say bye. I'm like, well, I have church at 6 o'clock. So I'm going to drop you off on this corner and tell you good luck in finding your hotel. Didn't even ask me if I, my hotel was in this general vicinity, but she just kind of, kind of dropped me off and gave me the peace sign and rolled on. I believe. I mean, I was naive, or I admit that. I believed he did not know where his hotel was, but the whole time he was lying. He was trying to get me to say, well, you can just stay at my house and we'll find that. And that just wasn't an option for me. It's kind of something you hear about in the story, you know, but when you, when you meet the person you're supposed to be with, you know. And, you know, it took her a while to figure it out, but, <laughs> but I knew right then and there that she was the person I was going to spend the rest of my life with. I was a very disciplined coach. I am a disciplined coach. And coming from the South, certain expectations of how you respond and what you do. And I see them to this day. I, we talk, we text, we visit. Um, it's a bond that, that the journey of coaching. She made everything we did a lot of fun. Um, it wasn't practices, you know, practices aren't, aren't, aren't always the most fun things to do, but somehow she made them fun. You know, the team bonding outside of the gym was fun, and uh, we just, she found a way to mesh a lot of different individuals um, kind of cohesively, and that was, that, that was really, I think that's what she's really good at. Transitioning from a player to a coach for me was easy in the sense, because I, I transitioned through the eyes of a player. So when I'm coaching, I coach from the, through the eyes of a player and how I would want my coach to talk to me or how my coach talked to me, how my coach treated me, how my coach encouraged me. My coach never put me down. Sure, they would yell at me. They would get on me. But they would always follow up with a pat on the back or words of encouragement. They never let me put my head down. They taught me to be confident in myself out there. And so that's how I coach. That's what I, I, I use basketball as a life skills tool with my, the people that I've coached, with my boys and the girls that I have. We used to have this thing, you do the ladder every day before practice, you know, depending on how bad she was, depending on how many times we did it. And, uh, you know, she would always be hyped up to do it. She'd always try to get us excited about doing it, especially if she was in a good mood. And nobody wanted to do it, but she would somehow find a way to motivate us. And, you know, I mean, obviously we didn't have much of a choice. We had to do it regardless, but you know, when she got us into it, got us going yeah. and got us hyped up to do it, we'd be, you know, trying to go as fast as we could and trying to beat each other, go down and touch the wall. I can remember one of the funniest stories. Um, one of the boys in practice, I don't know what he was doing. He, we were doing this drill and all I want him to do was get his arm up for a defensive drill. I kept saying it over and over and everybody could see I was just getting so frustrated. And I took a basketball and I just hummed it. Oh, and it just missed him. Now I was not throwing the ball at him, and, but it was certainly in his direction. And the boys thought that was the funniest thing. And they tell that story all the time. And I'm like, guys, I promise I wasn't throwing it at him. But they, were, they understood that moment. And we could have moments like that, but still walk off and hug and talk. So 
I was actually teaching the class over in the sack um, uh, one day, and she actually was outside the classroom. She knocked on the door, and I looked, and she had a um, a baby. Um, gosh, a, a, one of those. Uh, I forget it, little bibs. She had a baby bib, and it said, I love my daddy. And I was like, oh my God. <laughs> and so I was on cloud nine at that point. It was, it was amazing. Um, you know, you always think you want to wait to the right time to become a parent. I had to do a basketball camp in Midland. I covered every single emotion in that 40 minute drive. And I was angry with God because I had just gotten my angel. A baby that doctors told me I would not have. And here you are going to take me from her. And yet today you're going to have me go work with children, other people's children. And I might not even get to see my angel at this point in her life. I went to that clinic. I had the best day. And when I walked out of there, I knew I was going to see angel at 14, 17, 20. And I, think, I was thankful for that day because I started off angry, but I realized the blessing of going to work with them helped me to see that I need to fight so that I can be here to see this. You know, I look at our basketball families, whether it's been um, at Alma College or Sacred Heart, you know, those families and those administrators there have been um, instrumental, our assistant coaches, I mean, Christina Lilly, um, who's my assistant coach, but she's, you know, she was one of the first players that Keisha coached when she moved here. Um, she is. You know, if there's a person who's considered part of the family, she's part of the family. As I um, went through my senior year, she was a super huge um, role model and support system for me, and I went to her with a lot of things. And even at that point in time, she was always the person that would tell me what I needed to hear, not necessarily what I wanted to hear. And that's just really continued to be how she's influenced my life the last gosh, 10 years now. Angel is like a little sister to me. Um, I remember the day she was born, we were all over, um, well, I guess when she came home from the hospital over at um, Keisha and Damon's house, and she was like the size of a loaf of bread. She was so tiny and so precious, and all these basketball boys were like, uh, what do we do? She's so little, like they're all trying to hold her, and she was just tiny, and from that um, very beginning, she was just, somebody that was always at the gym and I was like, where's Angel? Where's Angel? I want to I wanna see her. In the gym, my best memories are when after games, one of the parents would have her and after every single game, he'd bring her to me and I'd hold her and we'd walk through the line and shake hands with the other team. And so here I am, this woman with an infant, going through the hand line, shaking hands with my baby in tow. The title of my book is Breast Cancer. When a family member has cancer, it makes you sad, scared, and mad and nervous. When I was six, I found out my mom had cancer for the third time. When I found out, it made me scared because she had a lot of days when she was sick. She said she couldn't play with me on her sick days, and it made me sad because she couldn't play with me. I try to help by um, reading to my mom or, you know, like reading to my mom because she likes to hear me read. My journey has definitely been one that has been uh, true to a fight. I was diagnosed in 07 the first time and went through several, several surgeries, chemo, lots of reconstruction, only to find out a year later in 2008 that the cancer was back in the same breast that they had removed. I always thought the question why, you know, why God, you know, why, you know, here's a person who's doing everything, everything, everything that you could ask for um, you know, she cares about others. She's, you know, a wonderful woman, um, you know, wonderful mom, a person who's, who values relationships, who, who looks out for others before herself. Why? You know, and why, 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 are you, why are you bringing this into her life? In 2009, I had decided to have a double mastectomy because I did not want to worry every time I went to the doctor of it being there. So I figured if I have them both removed, I'd be okay. 
And in 2012, sure enough, it was in my right breast. And we went through chemo and radiation at the same It was a hard summer. I lost my hair again. I told my dad once, I'd just be so glad when people stopped cutting on my, on my wife. Um, and, and that just, you know, that's one thing that really frustrates me. And as a husband, you sit there and you're just like, when is enough going to be enough? There was a time when I was so worried about Damon. And I had to call in my reserves, you know, my assistants. And I had to say on the side, all right, we need to make sure he's okay. You know, and so I was able to call on my bench to go in for me and take care of him. I think the shocking fear and all that stuff is always going to be there. But as long as you have God as your foundation, it, it provides you with the sense of um, calmness that you need to be able to make it through. I had gone to the doctor back in January because my back was hurting. And my doctor, Dr. Ball, who has just been a godsend in this all calls me in and she's very thorough when I go in. She wants to leave no stone unturned. So we do an MRI of my back. She calls us in right days after my pink game and says, it's cancer again. And it's spread into my bones. So it's now in my pelvic, my ribs and my spine. I mean, she's an amazing person, and it's like she's been through so much. How can somebody go through so much? And um, I think the part of it that strengthened my faith is that she, what she has gone through, she has the incredible faith that she has, and she's always offering everything up to God, and it's just unbelievable that she can do that. And it's very inspiring and very, very moving to see her be able to have that faith. You talked about game planning. It really is game planning. You know, you figure out, especially when, when cancer comes to the equation, you know, it's, you know, it's, it's, you know, it's like one of those situations where you're down, you know, now you're down. Now, what are you going to do to start getting back? And, you know, we, we, we talk a lot in basketball terms, but that's, you know, you're down 10. Okay, now you got to come together. You got to come together as a team and figure out how you're going to work through it to get those, to get those points back, to get back on top. But I was fighting and my boys and my family and the parents, the community, they were all there fighting with me. I would come home from chemo and balloons on my porch, flowers, stuff for Angel to do, because we beat it again. My team is, is not just the people that live with me. It's not just my brothers and sisters at home. It's my church family, it's my pastor. It's my friends that I talk to every day, my friends that I don't talk to every day. You know, my team, it's big, it's big. As much as I'm mad that my mom wasn't around to, you know, to be there when I married, uh, married Keisha or to meet Keisha or to meet her granddaughter or spend time with her granddaughter, you know, she prepared me for this, you know, and so that's, you know, so I'm always thankful for that. I'm human, I cry, I get sad, I look at Angel, Sometimes through the eyes of fear, because what if? But then I know that's just the devil, because God has a plan and a purpose. And there was a reason for me being diagnosed coaching boys basketball. There was a reason me being diagnosed and being told as I'm walking to my grandmother's funeral. There's a reason that it was not one, two times, but four times. Before my cancer, you could not get me to sit and talk about personal stuff with anybody. Before cancer, you could not get me to be confident in myself. I'm very confident who I am. I'm stronger because of cancer. I am not as intense in life. I laugh a lot more. You know, there's a poem out there about what cancer cannot do, cannot take your joy, cannot steal your spirit. Cancer can do so many wonderful things. It brings families together, it brings enemies together. It's tough, but at the same time, as a husband, you, you have to do it. Um, 
you know, you you grow up pretty quickly. And, you know, I, I think as, you know, I think sometimes as men, we think, okay, we're ready to get, we're ready to get married right away. And we know what that means. You have no idea what it means, <laughs> nor are you prepared for it. Um, and so you, these type of experiences help you through those processes. And, and, and if you don't have a solid foundation, you find yourself in a bad spot. And I've been lucky enough um, to have an amazing wife who, you know, who who is so caring, who is so, um, strong. People always ask me, how do you feel about four times? Don't you get mad? Don't you get upset? Yeah, it's natural. Sometimes I do get mad. But I have always prayed, God, if you can use anything, use me. And when you pray that prayer, you don't get to choose how he use you. You don't get to question it. You just got to go with the flow.